In the 40 years that preceded the dawn of our century, Japan changed from a feudal medieval society to a modern industrialized state. Unlike Europe, where the transition from an agrarian to a commercial lifestyle was a gradual one, in Japan, the change was abrupt, divisive, and bloody. The martial nature of Japanese society was scarcely diminished by the metamorphosis. Even the bitter and bloody civil war that heralded this new democratic era left the military ambitions of the Japanese people and their new rulers unsatisfied. In the fourth decade of the Emperor Meiji's reign, the days of sword-wielding samurai were still not a memory. Despite strict prohibitions, there were men still who wore swords openly and dressed their hair in the manner of the samurai. War between Japanese feudal states was replaced by wars against the neighboring countries of China and Russia. The enthusiasm and energy of the Japanese people that once cultivated the soil and supported the four traditional social levels of society were directed more and more towards the development of commerce. The business company became, as the samurai clan had once been, the focus of people's loyalty. Japan entered the modern world enthusiastically while maintaining the deeply held beliefs that were the very core of its culture. And yet, despite Japan's apparent rapid progress towards a Western-style democracy, lingering still in the twilight of few times were vestiges of the ancient feudal order, the martial arts of the nation. Swordsmanship, once a deadly affair, even when practiced with wooden swords, now made use of specially designed protective equipment. Rules were introduced to minimize injuries. Competitions became popular. Swordsmanship became a pastime rather than a profession, open now to both gentlemen and commoner. Modern fencing with the bamboo practice sword was added to the physical education curriculum of many schools. Ironically, even foreign military advisors stationed in Japan to train the new Japanese Imperial Army in modern warfare recognized the value of these arts and enthusiastically embraced them. However, despite the steps taken to modernize and popularize the ancient weapon arts of the samurai, the younger generation's interest leaned more towards the unarmed martial arts. In the early part of this century, to satisfy the public demand for safe and invigorating sports with a martial flavor, judo was developed under the supervision of Jigoro Kano, one of Japan's most respected educators. Its ancient cousin, Jiu-Jitsu, continued to flourish, although less publicly. Daito Liu Aiki Jiu-Jitsu, originally the secret art of the Takira clan, was taught for the first time to outsiders although not yet to the public at large. Its chief proponent, the dynamic and multi-talented Sokaku Takeda, declared that his art had 10,000 techniques. There were probably many more. Traditionally a subsidiary art to swordsmanship, Jiu-Jitsu had no coup de gras, no fatal blow to finish an opponent. Using a Jiu-Jitsu technique a samurai could easily disable a person of inferior rank when necessary. By doing so, he demonstrated his technical superiority and avoided the need to engage in combat with the social inferior. By not harming his antagonist, he demonstrated a degree of control that all samurai worked hard to acquire and took great pride in. In a previous age, an opponent who continued to resist the unbearably painful grips and holds of jiu-jitsu could easily be dispatched with a knife or a short sword with little further effort. However, in a country at peace, where arms were no longer carried, in the practice halls, jiu-jitsu techniques were now brought to a conclusion by the aggressor being held immobile. The face of Japan changed tremendously. Yet the heart of the Japanese nation was unchanging, ancient, cultured, rigidly structured, timeless. Feudal and modern democratic Japan 
existed at the same time and in the same place. The nation travelled by train to work in the offices of a metropolis that rivaled New York and London in size and prominence. It returned, in many cases, to homes little changed since the beginning of the feudal Edo period, two centuries before. The son of Dr. Tokujiro Otsuka, Hironori was born in Shimodate City, Ibaraki Prefecture, on June 1, 1892. His martial arts career began with jiu-jitsu at the age of five as a student of his great uncle, Chojuro Ebashi. Seven years later, after enrolling in Shimozuma Middle School, he commenced his study of Shinno Yoshinyu Jiu-Jitsu under the noted expert Tatsusaburo Nakaya. On graduating, he took a position with the Kawasaki Bank, but the martial arts remained the most important thing in this young man's life. To gain experience, he trained with experts of many styles, and by doing so, became a friend of Morihei Weishiba, the founder of modern Aikido. At the age of 30, Hironori Otsuka was awarded the rank of Menkyo Kaiden in Shinno Yoshinyu Jiu-Jitsu by Nakayama-sensei, a fine achievement for a man still young. Despite strong family objections, he yearned to become a full-time martial arts instructor and suffered the routine of a bank employee only out of respect for his mother. Otsuka had already decided to visit Okinawa and conduct research into karate when he met Gichin Funakoshi in 1922. Funakoshi had given a demonstration at a sports festival sponsored by the Ministry of Education and held at Ochano Mizu in Tokyo that year. Otsuka later sought him out as his lodgings at the Meisei Juku, a hostel for Okinawa nationals in Tokyo, and asked to enroll in his classes. Although he started karate at the relatively mature age of 30, his previous training stood him in good stead, and he soon became Funakoshi's senior assistant. Training under Funakoshi Sensei consisted almost entirely of base punching and kicking techniques followed by the practice of formal exercises or kata. This was as dictated by tradition and the leading masters of the day. All students were required to follow this exacting regime until their form was as perfect as possible, at which point, it was believed, the execution of techniques would become automatic and without the need for conscious thought. While this may seem an outdated concept, it is what has great merit. Constant repetition of the basic techniques is still the best way to acquire skill, build stamina, and gain an understanding of the inner meaning of karate-do. The remarkable movie footage of the founder of Wadoryu Karate that appears in this program dates from 1965. It is of great historical value in that it allows us to study the fundamental techniques of the style in their purest form and thereby avoid deviation from the method developed by the founder. As a result of a lifetime of strenuous training, at the age of 73, the founder retains much of his strength and vigor. His performance of the techniques that are unique to Wadoryu is both crisp and elegant, demonstrating a degree of control that very few at this age possess. The body is held erect, the movements are light, smooth and efficient. The hallmarks, in fact, of this sophisticated form of karate. As the punch is performed, the opposite hand is pulled back strongly to augment its power. Until the moment of impact, the movement is relaxed and flexible, the power being developed by speed rather than effort in accordance with the well-established laws of physics.
movement and thought must be natural and in accordance with nature's laws. Correct movement is referred to in Japanese as wat no ken, or harmonized skill. Correct attitude is called wat no kuro, the harmonized mind. The way of correct technique is called the way of harmony, wa no michi. Wadoryu karate is based entirely on these important principles. It is therefore called the way of peace and harmony. Sonobazuki is performed in Naihanchi stance. This is to develop the ability to transfer body movement and therefore energy to punching and kicking techniques by means of hip rotation. Basic techniques are truly the foundation of karate. Like any strong foundation, it can only be built by long-term effort, a piece at a time, and at the cost of great energy and effort to the builder. The basics must be mastered before progress can be made in karate. Their study becomes the work of a lifetime, and no karate instructor can afford to neglect their serious study. Each technique must be performed with the utmost effort. Each properly formed technique adds to the performer's skill and ability. All techniques must be performed with balance and correct timing. Unnecessary movements, such as drawing the fist back slightly before punching, must be avoided at all costs. Do not abbreviate a technique or introduce extra movement that serves no useful purpose. Punches and kicks must be performed completely and not hurried. Strong focus must accompany the completion of each technique. In this way, training will improve overall technique gradually but surely. There are no shortcuts in karate training. Only effort within a rational system of karate yeah. develops ability and the reward that it brings. It was long believed that most Wadoryu kata came directly from Gichin Funakoshi. This is an oversimplification. The picture is certainly not as clear as it has been painted. The kata of Wadoryu are actually a result of what the founder, Hironori Otsuka, learned from a variety of sources. When Gichin Funakoshi first arrived in Japan from Okinawa, he knew very few kata, perhaps only Kushanku and Naihanchi thoroughly. To his credit, trained with Kenwa Mabuni of Shitoryu to expand his knowledge. Funakoshi did become a major influence on Hironori Otsuka, but certainly there were others. Choki Motobu taught Naihanchi kata as the core of his karate method maintaining that this kata contained everything a karate man needed to know. Otsuka studied with Motobu, and his interpretation of Naihanchi, which was both forceful and effective, can still be seen in Wadoryu. Ken Wamabuni also coached the talented newcomer, correcting the Pinan kata that Otsuka had originally learned from Funakoshi. To what he received from these famous teachers, Hironori Otsuka added the results of his own research into karate, as well as many principles he had absorbed from his long years of jujitsu training. There are two ways of writing the Japanese character for kata. One suggests a fixed form that cannot be changed. The other 
indicates an organized form or shape that has a degree of flexibility, allowing it to be adapted to suit any situation. This means that once the shape or outward appearance of a cutter is mastered, its essence can be used to meet and overcome any force. This is the true secret of cutter.
빙연 선동! 빙양구등 From the Oshima Hiki, a record of a conversation between the Okinawan seafarer Peichin Shiohira and the Japanese scholar Yoshihiro Tobe, we learn of a great Kempo practitioner from China called Kusanku. It was he who taught this kata during his stay in Okinawa and after whom it is named.
Naihanshi is closely associated with Chōki Motobu. It was with this instructor the founder studied this kata and its practical combat applications. Although this kata appears in many styles of karate, its origins cannot be clearly defined.
方青春Gichin Fonokoshi's very best students were Otsuka Hironori, Takagi Masatomo, Nakayama Masatoshi, Ito Kenichi, and Konishi Yasuhiro. His followers believed that Otsuka's natural ability and jujitsu experience made him the foremost of the old master's students. As his skill increased, Otsuka started to incorporate into his karate elements of jujitsu that were second nature to him. The principles of evasion and absorption became part of his teaching, which greatly displeased his instructor. Those close to the now aging karate pioneer may well have been jealous of Otsuka's ability, and this would, in time, lead to many problems. Otsuka, having spent his formative years studying in the Jiu-Jitsu Dojo, where hard physical contact was deemed a vital part of training, now promoted the idea of practical fighting drills Kion Gumite that involved contact. A parting of the ways became inevitable. Gichin Funakoshi would not allow sparring, maintaining staunchly that only kata and basic training were necessary to produce good karate men. He demonstrated his belief by refusing to test his own fighting skills against other martial artists. When challenged by judo men, he asked Jigoro Kano the founder of judo and his sponsor to make the youngsters withdraw their challenges. There were two challenges he could not avoid, however, and both involved Choki Motobu. Confronted by his arch rival and his young protege, Funakoshi was grabbed and rendered helpless by Motobu's student, a judo fourth dan. Hironori Otsuka eventually intervened and, taking hold of the boy with a jujitsu technique, threw him to the ground. Motobu, an undisciplined but skillful and aggressive fighter, took delight in humiliating Funakoshi 
a man for whom he had little respect. Yasuhiro Konishi, shown here to the left of Motobu, reported that a newspaper carried the story of a fight that took place between the two in 1930. When Funakoshi finally faced his nemesis, his feet were instantly swept from beneath him, and he suffered the indignity, as he lay at Motobu's feet, of having his face menaced with the latter's enormous fist. The first incident with the Jewel man served to reinforce the reputation of Otsuka. The second damaged that of Funakoshi. Master Funakoshi based his teaching firmly on the practice of forms, kata, and basic training. Prearranged, controlled sparring was practiced, but not emphasized. The idea of competition, and therefore of combat in karate, was abhorrent to him. In 1922, he stated, it is not possible to have competition in karate as they do in kendo and judo, because if you strike your opponent in karate, it could be fatal. Funakoshi's students at the Tokyo University Karate Club clearly felt unfulfilled in their training, and in the late 20s, started experimenting with protective equipment that allowed them to spar in a somewhat realistic manner. Foremost among them was Jizaburo Miki. During a study trip to Okinawa, Miki demonstrated the kata he had learned from Gichin Funakoshi before Yabiku Moden. The renowned karate master that told him that what he was doing was not karate, but Okinawan folk dancing. Miki returned to Tokyo and, perhaps as a result of Moden's comments, enthusiastically took up full contact sparring with equipment to test his technique. He was not alone. Even karate legends such as Choju Miyagi and Kenwa Mabuni experimented for a short time with the new equipment, only to find it inadequate. Miki's dedication to Bogu Kumite, as it was called, was such that he co-authored a book with Mizu Hotakada that promoted sparring. Funakoshi with Otsuka finally withdrew from the Tokyo University Karate Club. Several reasons were given. Chief among them that the Japanese students did not treat their Okinawan instructor with sufficient respect. Perhaps it was a lack of respect that led to the withdrawal, or the desire of the students to study a more progressive and exciting form of karate. Otsuka did later return to the club as its chief instructor, so perhaps the students preferred the pragmatic approach of Otsuka to that of the aging Okinawan teacher. Probably we will never know. What is sure is that the departure of the two from the university set the scene for their own separation. Funakoshi had publicly criticized Otsuka for introducing jujitsu principles into his karate teaching. Further friction was caused by Otsuka's reputation rivaling and eventually surpassing that of his teacher, a fact that greatly irritated Funakoshi's other students. Finally, in 1930, the two parted company, but remained on good terms. If animosity existed, it was probably between Hironori Otsuka and Funakoshi's son Yoshitaka, also known as Giko. It was he who felt that, for the good of the Shotokan movement, Otsuka should be formally expelled from its ranks. Otsuka's reputation for practical ability continued to grow. In 1934, he formed the All Japan Karate Do Research Club and announced the establishment of his own unique style of karate. Official recognition followed when he was chosen with other eminent masters of the martial arts, including Shimizu Takaji, the 25th master of Shindon Muso Ryu, to sit on a police martial arts technical committee. In 1939, he formally registered the name of his style with the Butokukai in Kyoto. Hironori Otsuka had proved in the most practical way possible the value of his unique form of karate. By combining the sophisticated evasive movements of jiu-jitsu with the formidable striking techniques of Okinawan karate, he developed a comprehensive art that was greater and more valuable than the sum of its constituent parts. Kion Gumite, 
or the basic formalized fighting techniques of Wadoryu were developed by Hironori Otsuka and are unique to his style. Originally 36 in number, fewer are now practiced. Kiyongumita gives practical training in distance evaluation, timing, and simultaneous blocking and attacking. It is a contribution to the art for which Hironori Otsuka is entirely responsible and for which he will be most remembered.
The early 30s saw the dark clouds of war form over Japan and Horatian neighbors. In 1932, Manchuria in northern China was annexed by Japan. In 1936, the war with China started and the country was put on a military footing. In anticipation of recruitment by the Imperial Army, many young men sought training and demand for karate tuition became strong. Training changed from the constant repetition of basics and kata to the practice of kumite, or real fighting. Kumite with an emphasis on techniques that would knock the enemy down and if possible fatally injure him. The reputation of karate grew immensely when, after much research, the Japanese military spy academy chose karate as a defensive art their recruits would learn. As the war progressed, more and more karate students were called to serve their country, never to return from the Great Pacific War. Gichin Funakoshi, who had always believed that his karate was a discipline to be used for self-improvement and not for offensive purposes, was devastated by the events that overtook him. A sincere patriot, he was nonetheless appalled by the loss of life and the waste of talent that would prove so devastating to the country and the karate kunti. Later in life he wrote, I would often hear a young man say, as he knelt before me, Sensei, I have been drafted and I am off to serve my emperor. Every day I would hear my students report to me in this fashion. They had been strenuously practicing karate day after day, in preparation for encounters with an unmet enemy, and they believed they were ready. Of course, many students died in the battle. So many, alas, I lost count of them. I felt my heart would break as I received report after report, telling me of the deaths of so many promising young men. Then I would stand alone in the dojo and offer a prayer to the souls of the deceased, recalling the days when he had practiced his karate so diligently.